All right, I think we're good. Let me uh, set up here. First, the sponsors. Head over to www.johnbartoloshow.com and go check out the list of sponsors there. I want to thank a few of them now. Gallo Technologies for the walls behind us. Rhino Metals for the tables. Blackwater Ammunition. Appreciate Blackwater. Right on Optics. Volquartz and Firearms. And Pulsar. Thermals and infrared technology have come down in price. Go check out Pulsar. Love their stuff. Appreciate those guys. Appreciate all the sponsors. Don't forget Galco. Got a special guest today. I'm really excited to hear her story. She was the introductory UFC women's flyweight champion. See, I remember that. I got that right. We got... Now, how do you say it? Nico Mon Montanero. Montano. Montano. See, I tried to get it right. Yeah, yeah. Montano. I didn't want you to say it before. I was trying to get it exactly right. right and you are a representative of the tribe yeah navajo nation navajo nation. yeah our Dinette, Dinette tribe isn't that crazy it that's is that's crazy to me <laughs> how does that work can i become like an honorary member i mean i suppose anybody could you right know, as long as they're a good ambassador right saying the right things <laughs> i know i mean you could sit back and move the mic if you want by the way if you want to get more comfortable but so i'm intrigued by this so so you're this is like a thing this like you're involved this yeah. Is, yeah yeah how does that work um well i i suppose growing up there and being Dine in the first place helps a lot right and then, obviously. Uh, yeah when i when i won the belt um i uh, honestly didn't know that that was that there's you know this many people pulling for me right like granted i know how tight a uh, native like a tribe is you know a community it's a, it's a tribe yeah yeah so when I came home with the belt uh, the next day after I had fought Roxy, there was this huge parade set up and I wasn't ready. I was still <sighs> beat up and people were grabbing at me and I was like, what is happening? I'm just coming home to look at you guys, Arizona. Right, that's crazy. And there are like First Nation peoples who travel down from Canada to, to be at the parade. And I was just, I was just, ah. In awe. <laughs> Blown away. Yeah, completely surprised. Now, how how does that work when you become, you know, a part of, an, I call it an organization or, or a nation like that, and they take you in and they make you, you know, not just a part of the family, but a part of the tribe and a part of all things you know and they start involving you do they do they look at you for like it like all of a sudden are you like making decisions are you are they looking at you for advice and like how to do things right yeah um there's so we're our own entity um technically we're sovereign mm. although it's still not quite clear right that mm. we still have to we I still have to work under federal guidance um but we have our own president we have our own vice president and then we have different chapters throughout the Navajo Reservation. And my mom's the vice president of the chapter in Lagutchigai, where I'm from, where my grandparents okay. still own a trading post. So there's still like um, a government a system that ties everyone together. You could be like Manny Pacquiao. You could be like the queen of like the Navajo. Na yeah. <laughs> right? I'm serious. It's yeah. a thing. It's like a big deal. No, it, yeah, no. So the... Um, a lot so a lot of when the settlers came over just like a couple hundred years ago right christianity is big on the res a lot of people were put into boarding schools including my grandma so i grew up um going to mm. church and our father lately out there is from the philippines and so when i came back with the belt they're like father wants to see you father wants to see you it's amazing <laughs> yeah it's it, i i find this like it's a like that's a that's an amazing thing like the culture the community the sense of community is far better than than anything we have off the res you know it's like i i mean that's an honor too and you carry it's a lot of responsibility to carry but it was something that intrigued me you know going through your stuff and looking into you know kind of what you're a part of and, and what you're all about and i was like this is a cool story because it's a whole world that not a lot of people are exposed to yeah, I think a lot of people look at us as a third world nation within our nation. And I think a lot of it is like, we live in poverty, but it's, you know, when we were living off the land, 
we still do, but when we were living before colonizers came here, we were totally equipped. And then the whole thing with like just genocide mm. <laughs> and uh, scorched earth when they had us walk down for the long walk. And this is just the Navajos. Like there's so many other tribes and they're their own people with their own languages also and subcultures off of those. So I think um, a lot of people throw native or, you know, indigenous peoples together. Did you have to get a whole education on? So, oh. it's sort of, you know, you got to kind of be political too in, right. in a time like this, because even the term native American is pretty sensitive to say, because, you know, the people were, you know, Napoleon and yeah, yeah. everybody was discovering America, but we were here before that. So we're not technically Native Americans because it wasn't America when we were living here. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it, it, it's, I don't even know the right way to do it, right? Like people get mad now. It's not the Washington Redskins anymore. It's the Washington football team. Do you care about that stuff? Or are you like, who, who gives a shit? It, it, like, where do you stand on it? No, I mean, I appreciate that people are taking recognition and um, accountability for the appropriation that our culture has been through, you know? Mm. A lot of the time, I think it's just easy to talk about us indigenous peoples as a past tense. And right. I still, I still go face to face with people and they're like, Native Americans used to do this. And I'm like, oh, we we still do that. And, you know, we do more. There's 100%. more intricacy with it all. and. So it just, it's a, I think it's kind of mind blowing to people to consider that we're still present mm. and we're still holding ceremonial and traditional gatherings and, you know, not in this time, obviously it's a pandemic, but everything is still sustainable. Does the Cleveland Indians bother you? Um, <laughs> or is that like, one, you know, I mean, I'm trying to figure out where the yeah. line is. I, I see, I can understand the Washington Redskins one, the Cleveland Indians one. I'm kind of like, I don't yeah. know about that. I think that's, you know, fair. Uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I, I mean, no, not necessarily. I mean, not necessarily um, comfortable with it, I suppose, because when we were being discovered, quote unquote, discovered, uh, Everyone thought we were a whole different culture with the in, from India Indians, mm -hmm. right? And so that terminology doesn't It's even, not proper. No. See, now I'm learning something. It makes sense. <laughs> no, but it's good. I, I really wanted to ask you these questions. Now, you get into fighting, which I'm not sure of where that comes from, right? Like, it's uh, they're not fighting on the reservation, I imagine. Or growing up, you weren't you know, fighting everybody in the neighborhood. How did, how did that happen? How did you get into that? I grew up fighting everyone in the neighborhood. Seriously? <laughs> if you did, that's freaking <laughs> awesome. Well, mostly my cousins. We would just, you know, play fight all the time, hang out on the trampoline, toss each other off. Um, it's more, wild. More so Greco fun in, in that sense, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are, like, boxing gyms on the res. You know, there's a lot of things to help kids. Um, so it was structured. You weren't, like, fighting in the streets. Yeah, no. I mean... <laughs> Yes and no. <laughs> right. I imagine, I suppose, right? That's pretty freaking wild. And then, um, now, how, uh, I imagine, right, your family had to be like, I ask almost every female fighter this, they had to be like, you're crazy, <laughs> right? There had to be that moment. Like, what do you mean you want to go fight? Yes and no. My dad was a boxer. He was a golden so he got boxer. It. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then my grandpa was in Vietnam. You know, my great grandpa was a co-talker. My cousins were in the war. So it's like in the, in, my cousin was in Afghanistan. He did like two tours. And so, so they got it. Yeah. And I was, I was always hanging out with like my cousins. We'd build fires outside and just wrestle each other and have fun. So it wasn't that far fetched when I went, because I initially, when I was going to college, I was like, okay, I need to learn some self-defense. Right. I'm on campus, I'm going to attack you. And so I started doing jujitsu, but I had already known how to hit pads because of my dad. Mm. Now, was your mom cool with it? Yeah. Okay. So you had good support. <laughs> yeah. Great support. Even my grandma, everyone was like, yeah, show me how sure. tough we are. Like, let's, yeah, let's do it. Mm -hmm. So you start getting into it. You start out, you have, you hit a home run and, and, and you got thrown right into the, the start of a new division. You go through that and you get to win the belt the first time mm -hmm. out the gate, the inaugural belt. 
And that's a, you know, not an easy thing because it's new and they're building out the division and you don't know what it's going to look like <laughs> and how it's going to happen. And did you feel snake bitten when, you know, you couldn't get your stride right after winning and figuring out like what the next steps are going to be and lay a plan? It had to happen. It had to feel all so quick, right? Oh, yeah. Um, prior to winning the, uh, the UFC belt, I was the king of the cage um, That's right, champ yeah. also. So, uh, you know, and in, like in a sense of my reality, I was just like trying to bring everything back to me being humble and being like, it might have been luck, like don't get all crazy. And then I got on the show and then was capable, you know, I was, I saw what I was capable of. Mm. And so by the time it came fight time to winning the belt and I did, and like I said, I went home the next day to the res and there was just this big parade huge parade and everybody was grateful and so i was that really took me by surprise and that's weighed I, like ten thousand pounds exactly right. the world was on my shoulders and i was like all right i guess we're gonna have to take this somewhere else and then yeah things started to not happen for me you know it's been like that since but i mean i've been learning from all of these uh roadblocks um and because you were thrust right in it yeah. i mean that's the thing i mean you were you were kind of tossed right in it from amateur it was a quick ride yeah i only had five amateur fights all those fights were done in the first round under three minutes maybe one was like close to three minutes yeah i mean but it's funny it's an overwhelming response of people that still looking forward to you getting back into it and finding your stride and your groove and i feel like once you do, you're going to be right back in that mix, but it has to feel like, oh man, like when is that going to come, right? When's that, that moment? But it takes time because yeah. you didn't really have a chance to have 10 or 15 fights before you got thrown into that moment. Mm -hmm. So it has to feel that way. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely frustrating, but you know, it took a, a while for me to actually just work on the things that i wanted to work on outside of fighting after mm. everything kept falling through um because most of you know everyone would get amped and all the net people all the indigenous peoples from alaska to all the way down here they're like let's go let's go and then come time to fight something happens and i can't fight and not everybody knows the whole story of like being concussed or my mcl tear or getting covid and having to pull out for these reasons instead of whatever they're thinking and they're just thinking like i'm failing them and then it makes me feel like i'm failing a whole people and a whole tribe and a whole no nation. but the con concussion's a hard one and those are real yeah i mean people who say you know i don't know who says you know if anyone does say like that's not a th it's a thing i mean you have to be very careful and aware of it and self-aware because it, it can in concussion now with cte and everything else you have to be insanely careful and you have to be very self-aware and if you're not 100 percent, it's it's not something you can toy around with or screw with and i imagine that's what you're dealing with right now is kind of figuring out what those next steps look like as you start to flesh that out because a concussion is very real and it happened in a car accident right yeah i got oh, rear-ended here in vegas that's crazy how how fast was it like um the whole road uh, like uh, we were, i was on the freeway and everyone just came to this abrupt stop because there's so much construction going on mm. and then i can see in my rear view mirror that guy was slowing Motoring. down but he wasn't com he wasn't coming to a complete stop and i can like, oh, flash it to be like no we're stopping dude just come come to a complete stop but i think he was anticipating some momentum still and just ran right into me jesus <laughs> yeah my god it's that and you know then you figure i'm sure initially like most people oh, i'm fine you know oh, like yeah. whatever I, let's go but it's not it doesn't work that way with concussions no i went to jujitsu that night to do the rest of oh. my practice and then everything just kept like turning and my whole head my whole body just kept looking my eye just kept leading me to the ground and it just felt like i got off of a boat the next day i was um I remember like my first time on a boat and then I remember like taking a shower and closing my eyes and like washing my hair. And that was that same sensation that I was feeling of like just getting off of a boat. So I wrote, I texted uh, Heather Linden mm. and uh, I was like, is my brain bleeding? What do I do? Am I dying? She's like, no, but it sounds like you have a concussion. Get down here when your symptoms subside. Um, and then we've been working on it diligently ever since. I get vertigo like crazy, so I, I can understand. You do? Yeah, I get I have I I get super dizzy sometimes and super lightheaded. It's um I think a a, a form of Meniere's. Mm -hmm. So 
if I, I can't, I can do things that go fast straight ahead. If I do anything that moves me side to side too much, I get super lightheaded. So like, doing jujitsu i don't tumble you know people like to tumble and i never really understood the the science somebody who knows jujitsu out there can tell me uh behind why they they do that but i i, I never roll into the middle of the mat to like to, you know like he, there's always that guy that like rolls into the middle of the mat or that girl and i'm like what the fuck are you doing because like when the coach is like hey you know john come here like you see that guy who does like a triple somersault into the middle of the mat i'm like what the fuck are you doing but I guess that's a thing. I I, it's a style for sure. I've yeah. done some guard passes where I have to pass an open guard. And so I dive for like a Kimura right. or like a something to where I'm like getting inverted. And then I have to anticipate that roll because they're going to counteract. Yeah, I, I hate the guy who rolls into the middle of the mat. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah whatever or just an Ari roll out in the middle of nowhere i'm 240 not- pounds if i roll anywhere it's gonna look like a fucking <laughs> tank you know I, it doesn't look it doesn't look good it's not it's not sexy so uh, you know concussions and and going through that never puts you on that that proper path and there is no no direct proper path to recovery for those things so you have to kind of take your time with it then you start easing back in and you get the setbacks do you feel like you're getting closer to be where you need to be to be good to go? Um, yes. Um, I still haven't been able to, I'm not cleared to have full contact. Right. So I've just been introducing weights, um, the past couple, this past week, actually with, with my strength coach, Mm. Bo Sandoval, we've been implementing some Olympic lifting, some power lifting just to see how like my head is going to deal with the pressure and the movement and the impact. How do you feel? Fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard. You know, you don't want to, I don't want to get my hopes up. I've been doing that for a couple of years with this, but like I said, in terms like it's leading to new projects. I'm finding that my motivation and my passion to help my people through, um, fighting is opening up new doors. Yeah. For other projects. Uh, and, and it, like anybody knows that nobody can be an athlete forever. Oh God, no! That's what we talk about <laughs> mostly here. It's like what you're doing outside of the ring and yeah. what you're doing off the mat. Yeah, it's not a forever thing. I mean, I'm my body feels like like hot garbage all the time from trying to train and still trying to move at that level. I'm not 25 anymore, and I'm not even 35. So you you feel not the same, and the wheels start coming off. It's listen con- concussions i came from a football background they're a very real thing and uh-huh. they're and they're a very scary thing uh-huh. and they're the reason why a lot of folks are saying things like my kid will never play this or my kid will never play that mm-hmm. and look everybody's getting one thing in common they're all getting bigger faster and stronger so everybody's hitting harder mm-hmm. everybody's moving quicker and that's a real thing now this didn't happen to you in the ring. It happened to you outside of the ring, which is even scarier. Uh, it was a moving projectile, a car. You know what I mean? Cool, yeah. yeah. And, you, and you're and you on the other side of it. You just have to figure out what that other side is going to look like. And no matter what it is that you do, I think you're going to embrace it. And I think already you've, you know, you're in a unique position because to your people and to the tribe, you, you, you showed a path. And that sometimes is the first step is showing a path, whether you people view it as a way off the reservation or they view it as uh, a way to move forward or an, uh, an approach. Everybody looks for that. And that's why, you know, whether you're Italian, Irish, whatever, people will have these heroes. They say like this person did this and they can follow that path. So no matter how it turns out for you, you're going to be an inspiration to someone who can follow that path. Yeah, right. Leading by example, I think, yeah. has been like a really good um, eye opener for me too. Because in that light, I'm able to really work my my best to you know exceed my potential. I think I'm capable of a lot of a lot more, and just my own body being able to be self sufficient. You know, when I'm going to Alaska here in a bit, I'm going to go moose hunt, and I'm going to bring back some meat. Oh, we'll get to and that. Yeah, we'll get to that. And so there's just like a lot of things that I think all of us are capable of and i like to show that by leading by example yeah and i and look here's the thing and i've said this to a ton of decorated fighters sitting in that same chair maybe in the future it's something like look at what they're doing with espn now with the grapple stuff maybe Mm -hmm. it's that maybe Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be hey i gotta get punched in the head Mm -hmm. you know what i mean maybe it's something along those lines you know um if you i mean if you buy into jujitsu like the cult that most people do 
<laughs> you know, and maybe it's something along those lines and you don't know. And yeah. when you know, and you're ready, you're going to figure that out. And I'm excited for it. Yeah. So it'll yeah. be fun. Uh, now get out of the moose hunt. Let's get to that. I want to talk about this because you're, you actually are an avid hunter and love all that. Love the outdoors legitimately. Yeah. Yeah. I live in the mountains here <laughs> my compromise <laughs> not literally in the thing. mountains in Mount charleston uh, you yeah but you, you don't you're making it sound like you live in a teepee you live in <laughs> you live in a home right i live in a house okay. i do build fires i you know make my own breakfast with the with the idea of i can make this on over a campfire though <laughs> it's pretty wild especially prepping right now for this trip now yeah actually yeah you have to get the mindset now when you when you're doing this and you're preparing for like a moose hunt it's it's no joke a moose is a, is a no joke hunt no no and and you have to get a, a mentally prepared do you go with a guide or do you just go with family or how are you doing it um with friends but they're, yeah they're ultimately guiding me and yeah. this is like my third one in about a year and so i just dove right into it after my first sockeye fish um adventure going to uh you know a couple mm. years ago and then uh my friend who brought me out there was like oh there's a moose hunt going on in december you want to go camping like winter camping in alaska and go moose hunting in december and i'm like yeah, heck yeah i do how long are you gonna go up for so this will be for two weeks but i'm hitting a couple of places and then i'll and then holding some workshops some self-defense workshops for local villages and making sure that i'm just like there Working. and approachable yeah and like I said, I like to lead by example. So, you know, as long as I feel like I'm contributing to my community, because um, I know how much, like we said, they love me, you know? like Yeah, you have to. They appreciate me, so I have to show my appreciation and keep it reciprocal. Yeah, I, I always think about this. How does that work now? How do you balance the giving back versus charging? Because I imagine you command a decent rate, you know, to go into a gym. How do you balance that when someone's like, hey, Nico, you want to? do a seminar and you're like well yeah <laughs> but you know can you feed me like how does it work like yeah 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 i ask you know what their budget is and what they're capable of you know um paying for and i'm always gonna help out i'm always gonna be able to do that but i need to make sure i'm not going into debt you're not losing money <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah because it's not a no and that's what you try to always explain to people and and, and it's got to be hard because there's the emotional component of like i want to do something but let's have it make sense and let's have it make sense all around. But yeah, I mean, I imagine when you go up there, you want to get a little work in, a little fun in, and I think that's always good and a little training mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at the same time. But when you go on the hunt, you're not guaranteed to get something. No, that's what happened last time. But that's the, that's fun. You know, that's part of it. That's like going into a fight and then not getting your fight. So <laughs> I've totally lived that over and yeah. over. And it's like, uh, I mean, it's just so surreal, the scenery out there, the geography. It's amazing. Um, it's, it is amazing. And I come from a uh, like great, a huge horizon on, in, in the desert and on the Navajo Res. Um, and then you go to Alaska and you're just on water and you're around orcas and there's just mountains and there's fog and it's just, it's beautiful. So regardless if I come out with a moose or you know fish or whatever i'm just excited and grateful for that opportunity to well i hope you'll get there. fish at least at <laughs> least right yeah. that's like the, the least that comes out of it so you go on the moose hunt if you get one do you mount it um no because traditionally you don't it's not necessarily for sport but i'll take it if you <laughs> i'll take it if you want it. i know I that first one we did, I uh, I was like, who's gonna take the antlers? And they're right. like, nobody. They're like, are you gonna carry that? And I was like, sure, I am. So I hooked it on my back, and those suckers are heavy. All right. But they're, uh, it's still in Alaska. They're it's aging, so it's expensive know. too to taxidermy them things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, uh, so well, they use like the moose, the entire animal for everything. Right. So it's really cool to you watch. You can make all kinds of stuff out of it, out of it. I mean, but but I mean, a, a badass mount wouldn't be a bad thing either. I know above my fireplace, but I'm like, put it in the backyard and just <laughs> <laughs> leave it there, right? I'll take it in here if you don't want. I mean, I mean, like it's not that I don't want it, <laughs> right? No, I know. And you you know, listen, they can they can do replicas too of it, you know, in mm. you know to to have it. But you know, you never know. 
what uh what are you hunting it with um we use an 817 i however i am not uh i wasn't trusted with a gun out there mm. so i did a lot of practice but i walked around with a hatchet for the most part just mm. because i'm still getting used to everything you know nobody taught me how to hunt growing up and i just kind of fell into this like i said this past couple of years and now i love it and so i'm trying to learn everything about it and be as involved as possible because i can see that it can feed an entire village right and you know whoever takes the shot depending on the distance it's a big responsibility oh i know i've been yeah yeah big responsibility uh, you don't want to lose the damn thing no and no. especially w we were hunting and so the um in uh, december so the sun was going down at like three and we got the moose and we're like oh man we got to beat the sun we like literally got to beat the sun because it was mm. going down so fast and there's grizzlies out there i walked by grizzlies like 100 feet away with just my hatchet and i'm like guys i need a gun what are you? they're like no yeah. no gun for you yeah, yeah it, and well i mean if you're still dealing with the concussion too there's a whole myriad of oh, <laughs> myriad no. of issues there so i i, I can uh, understand I but mean, a hatchet i can throw a hatchet what um, other what other hunts do you want to go on though in the future what are you um, thinking well you know, as soon as I get more comfortable, like I'll go and shoot um, that A17, mm -hmm. shoot some pistols. I've shot, shot some shotguns. I like uh, I like deer jerky. Growing up, we had a bunch of mule on the res. Um, rams. I was watching Meat Eater for mm. like the past this whole weekend. <laughs> Prepping <laughs> mentally. <laughs> and I want to be able to like skin my you know harvest it. Yeah, it's a lot of work but sheep sheep definitely um we grew up butchering sheep not necessarily hunting sheep right um but there's rams out there too and there's elk in alaska so i mean there's a bunch of things a bunch of things <laughs> yeah moose is moose is one of the one of the one of the crazier ones though if you can if you can bag a moose out on that trip that would be pretty wild uh now any desire ever to go on a grizzly hunt because that would be the the big deal that would be and we had one in our sight we walked right by it and then we climbed the tree and then we we're like look we climbed the tree <laughs> what do you mean because like sometimes you need to climb the tree to see like if oh. there's moose out in the muskeg or that they're out in the meadow or where and we're like we see a moose right there and then i looked down and i had my vinyls and i was like there's a grizzly right yeah. there and then you don't see it and then you see it and then it's the biggest thing you've ever seen in your whole entire life. and they're like I can't believe we walked right by that. And I'm like, why do I not have a gun? <laughs> yeah, like that's, yeah. yeah the grizzlies there, uh, you know, they'll leave you for dead. Yeah. I mean, they're terrifying, some of them. Um, but I, w I would, I'm interested. Dene, however, are not supposed to be messing around with bears because they're like a deity. Mm -hmm. And so they're part of like uh, some of the holy, pe like, uh, an you know, sacred animal. It's a sacred animal, yeah. Yeah. Um, but maybe I can get away with saying that it's a brown bear and not a black bear. Because there's no brown bears on the Navajo Nation. Yeah. <laughs> there's only grizzlies up there. Now, do you, hunt, you, you ever do any hunting in Arizona? No. Like I said, I've never really gone on a hunt before. You know, my uncle probably has gone on a couple. My cousin on a couple. But I was too young whenever they I did. think what there is to hunt in Arizona. There's deer. There's deer. Elk. There's elk. Um... I'm pretty sure there's sheep, but I haven't seen any. Yeah. I know there's sheep in Colorado, like the Four Corners area. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So maybe around there too. Yeah, Ar Arizona would be a little bit of a a tough one for me to. Uh, I know deer and elk would be available, but beyond that, trying to figure out what else is available. But that's that's wild. I mean, I guess in all senses, and I had this this conversation with with Dana a little bit, and and some of the other folks that have been on the UFC. I I I think what I have figured out nico is it's it's a desire to be more capable right like it's yeah. a desire for you guys and gals as fighters to be more capable and self-sustaining because you see not just the men fighters but the women fighters too you see like ronda now lives like on a farm which like people you know that come from that warrior mindset they want to live that way and it's they live that way in all phases yeah 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 i mean i know i'm capable of uh protecting myself you know and i just want to keep exploring emotionally mentally physically what else i'm capable of doing 
And if it's overcoming standing in a cage against a worthy opponent, or if it's standing mm. in a meadow and you have you're looking directly at this right. animal that you're going to kill, and you know, just got to find ways to overcome certain cer- situations and then be strong through it all, but also be mentally in charge of what your emotions are le- going to try and lead you to do. And that's, and, and that's the term, you know, that comes to mind is just capable and being emotionally equipped and understanding, you know, what the challenges are that life's going to throw at you and being able to feed yourself, being able to take care of yourself, being able to protect yourself, all the different facets. That's what I feel leads people down that road of what I, what I would consider as true self-defense, you know, uh, can you survive if you had to you know those are all real questions especially now with covid those are like all real questions right you know that aren't just you know in any one culture they're in every culture now and if you're not doing that i think something's wrong you know i think you need to be right yeah i think it's a great self-discovery to see um your limits and then exceed them you know keep pushing those boundaries daily and mm. then figure out where you can grow because I mean, that's what life is about is growing and learning. That's science. That's entropy. That's literally everything is to not be stagnant. No matter where you think you find yourself, if you think you find yourself trapped or still, there's always more room to grow somewhere. You just have Mm. to find it and keep that momentum as soon as you do. Do you think people keep leaving cities? Yeah. I mean, I'm living here in Vegas and since COVID everyone is on top of that mountain like every single mm. weekend lines of cars are just like insanely long going up to Mount Charleston and yeah. I mean, look at New York and look at you know everybody's like getting out of the cities you know I think that's a trend that's going to continue and I mm. think you're going to see more and more people move to you know the rural areas and and start to seek that kind of space you know yeah I I also think, I mean, it's it's great, but I also think there needs to be etiquette. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not a lot of people understand that when you go for a hunt, there's other people hunting and other people using guns, so don't be in the way. It's or, a great point. Yeah, it, just being mindful and like understanding yourself, be self-aware of what's happening around you. I think the biggest thing is I think people need to have a gut check on is being more present. Like if mm-hmm. you're if you're go, trying to live that life, you're trying to transition from a city life to living, you know, off the, more off the land. I wouldn't ever say completely off the land, but more off the land and hunt. And we have a, a ton of new gun owners, right? A ton of new people out there. They have to understand, like you just said, that there's others out there doing the same thing. So they have to be self-aware and present in the moment and understand all that. And that's going to be a, an interesting transition. For people yeah i think for the most part people are so used to being accommodated but out in not in a city you're not going to be able to just go out and have the luxuries that you do and so you're gonna have to actually work for these things and you have to prep and plan and expect that it's going to take a long time to get what you want to get mm-hmm. what you're working for and so don't trash the environment along the way yeah 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 be mindful exactly self-aware make sure that what you're getting back is what you're putting out so that you know we can all just keep living sustainably right that's a good no it's a great point and i think uh you know you like to believe that everybody within the what is it 12 or whatever months that we've been in covid that people are the learning curve will you know but it's not gonna it's gonna take a lot of time like you said there's gonna be a huge flux of not just hunters out there but people just living in that outdoor lifestyle and what that encompasses and obviously we're seeing huge growth in that market i mean people want to camp now more than ever people want to go out now more than ever and have that experience outside um and what that looks like and i think you're going to see more and more people make the move you know whether it's to you know the montanas of the world the dakotas i don't know uh how alaska's numbers are but i imagine a lot of people are just trying to move and and get out of these cities and, and have that experience you know but they get a lot to learn and a lot to learn pretty quickly especially if they're going to try to live off the land yeah i mean to say the least to say the least you know and what that looks like now whatever happens or whatever you know happens up in alaska you're gonna have a freaking blast oh yeah oh yeah that's for sure you'll have an awesome time and do you do you know 
do you prefer to do seminars on reservations or how does the how when you're choosing a, or trying to figure out where to go i imagine that gives you like a huge embedded audience right yeah yeah it's a audience that i can speak comfortably to because i was a res girl growing up mm. you know, running around um and we did like we still have hogans we still have dirt floors we still hold ceremonies we still dress traditionally and think turquoise you know turquoise is our uh, shield it's mm -hmm. our protector and i still fully indulge in these cultural traditional ways of thinking because they can be implied to life you know um my when i got my mcl tear i was like okay i'm gonna be walking every single day i'm not gonna take that for granted again and then when i got my tonsillectomy i was uh, living in that basement so i couldn't really even see the sun and then I was like, okay, I'm going to go for a walk. Like, I'm going to be outside every single day. Made a promise to myself. And then with uh, this concussion, you know, I'm not able to, I wasn't able to physically work out or physically do anything for a while or even mentally work out because mm -hmm. just had to give my brain a rest. So no TV, no nothing. So I was just like, okay, I'm going to become an awesome meditator, great, a great Jedi. But then you tie all these together and it's like the Navajo tradition. You wake up early with the sun, you go and pray and you give your gratitude you give your plan for the day and then you put in, you put out your thoughts that you're going to be able to contribute for that day. Right. And understand that it's a daily process that you're going to have to keep working for in order to become successful in the end. And so I like to teach and share that with like my culture with a bunch of other cultures. Cause like I said, we're all our own entity. We're on our own, we're all our own tribes. We speak our own languages, but we have, parallels in our culture and parallels with our deities and how we like show respect so being able to help educate and learn at the same time that's i mean that's the way to live and is that your dream is that what you would do after fighting yeah yeah um yeah i would right now i'm working on a utilities program well i have a utilities business i should say i have a utilities business on the res and it's up for bid and uh, my manager, Ricky Constead, just helped me um, start that up. And so in that sense, I'm going to be able to give back to my community because there's a mm. lot of people who live without Wi-Fi wow. or running water still. And there's a lot of elders who are cold, you know, or like literally <laughs> like they don't have any food. They oh, don't sure. have any electricity. And they live on the dirt roads 20 miles out of nowhere in the mountains. And no one's taking care of them. And there's like little kit, you know, it's just like our community needs a community effort to keep living sustainably. But the reservation loves no interference, right? That's the whole thing. Well, you know, our, our history with the U.S. government is not good. No. And we signed the treaties to where we held up our end of the bargain and we still got nothing from it. You know, we're still being recognized as defeated. And when we had to sign the treaties because we we're promising to live in harmony with everything with the colonizers and then uh yeah so i'm not sure if you're familiar with like the long walk no f fill me in so <laughs> it's it good stuff i'm i'm interested <laughs> i want to hear it from you so um it was in february i'm not quite sure how long it is but it was from arizona to new mexico bosque redondo and um so i'm from an area um so that picture right there is monument valley okay and then there's this other huge canyon um canyon de Chez, and there's plenty of stories and petroglyphs and everything that's still echo in there and still families that live in these places and, and then uh so in, the settlers came they couldn't figure out how to gather us together to uh kill us right because <laughs> we knew the land we knew how to hide we knew how to like be quiet and so eventually they were able to gather us up because they started burning the land and so that was the scorched earth policy mm -hmm. and so we all had to hide um in canyon de shade there is like this rock called monument rock and everyone went and hid up there and the colonizers still couldn't find where we were and we we're shooting arrows off of those rocks and we we're like getting the colonizers and they're like, okay, okay, truce, 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 come down. We came down and they're like, psych, now we're going to walk you guys to the, uh, to Bosque Redondo in the middle of February. You guys are going to be on foot, you know, bunch of disease. Right. And then, um, 
we got to Bosque Redondo and then they're like, okay, we're going to turn back with the whole idea of us being like, okay, we're going to be cooperative because we just want peace. Right. And you look at a bunch of history books um, and just a bunch of oral stories. Navajos are really peaceful um, around the area. There's Hopi or Pueblos, uh, Aztecs, and uh, we're just known as the more peaceful people. And um, so we walked back, our land completely scorched. And so we had to figure out a way, you know, we always right. have to figure out a way. And but then, they figured they'd run you into the ground along the way. Yeah, we signed the treaties when we got back. And the treaty said that they would help with our education, um, uh, utilities, um, just making sure we have the basics, right? And we still don't, like, there's still not, we still don't have running water. We can't even, we don't own our land. We have to have land leases, land site leases. We can't even own the land that we live on. It's just, it's ridiculous. The amount of, um, I guess, uh, it's not naive. What's the other word? I guess just not knowing. Right. Right. The history of it all. And like I said, people talked when they talked to me and they're like, Navajos, but Indians get all this money from the government. And it's like, no, no, we no. don't. We can't even own our own land. We don't. Our education system is based on a westernized colony, but we don't. We still work off the barter, bartering system. We don't have utilities. And we don't have businesses that can afford workers to come in and make the money and grow our economy that way because we don't have it. Because we were promised that by the government. We never got it. I think the misconception is people think like they think if you're, you're you know, Navajo or any, whatever uh, tribe you belong to. I think people think, you know, you own a casino mm -hmm. and you guys are all closet rich. Yeah. And I think that's the misconception. I think that's one of the misconceptions. So obviously um, history has not been kind to the tribes and to, and to a lot of the different nations. And I think, um, you know, the misconception is then it leaps frogs, leapfrogs to the 90s around that time, late 80s, early 90s, when these casinos start coming in heavy. Mm-hmm. You know, I forget when Foxwoods was built in Connecticut, but around around that time, that, I remember that being one of the bigger ones up near me mm -hmm. in New England. And people just think, oh, she's got to be closet rich, right? She owns a casino, you know, don't cry for them. Yeah. But that's a very small percentage, right? Very small. And Navajos, or Diné, really, um, I think we have two casinos. Um, and, like, we don't see any money from that. We don't get checks sent out to us. Uh, I go straight to the Navajo Nation uh, Council and, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I've never seen a check from a casino in my you life. You know, and, and, and that's a different, that's a whole different business. Yeah, different it, infrastructure. A different infrastructure, different everything. And that's not for every tribe. No, yeah, exactly. Like I said, each tribe signed their own treaty with their own entities. Granted, each of those tribes still don't, aren't able to own their own land. And that's why all these like pipeline things come into play because... Some of these pipelines are going through, like, serial, uh, uh, ceremonial graveyards. Like, some holy people were born on there. Or, like, uh, that place, that monument is seen as something holy. You don't mess with it, right? You live in harmony. You respect it just like it would be a living thing. Like, if it was a right. bear. You don't mess with it. And these pipelines are getting made through these lands where we signed treaties to be peaceful. And we're still getting run over and we're still not getting respected how do you how do you fix it though right like how how do you get how do how do you yeah i mean it's it, right it's a lot right to take in but my question would be like what's the fix like do you do, i mean i think the recognition like like with mm. these these um these uh teams right starting there just the recognition of being like okay these people are still in existence what if we were going around saying oh you know fuck the guineas yeah, yeah. Know. Really, you know, no like, i mean seriously and these were these terms were derogatory when they were named them you know mm. so i think i think people's complaint nico is like it because like and i'm not saying it's right or anything i'm mm -hmm. you know i i think the complaint is like it's a slippery slope right like the the term yankees could be construed as like a negative term right mm -hmm. uh in some way shape or form. i'm not comparing them to all the 
SJWs out there, the social justice misfits. It, but I'm saying it can be misconstrued, right? And so what do you do? Do you throw them all away? You know what I mean? I think what bothers people is more like if we're going to get it right, get it right in one swoop. Or if you're going to, you know, if you're going to make certain subtle changes, you know, make these change like don't make a big deal of it. I think I think people's issue more comes in as like the back and forth and you, you know what I'm saying? Like it's kind of like, you know, okay you don't want to call them the washington redskins we'll come up with a name and let's have it make sense now you know mm -hmm. whatever that looks like um i think i think it's more the the back and forth it's like people are frustrated and it's like what's next i don't think it's so much that particular topic i think sometimes people are like what are you going to go after next can we do everything i think people just like to rip the band-aid off in one swoop Oh, yeah. And it doesn't work that way. We know that. Yeah. 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 But people I mean, still do it. Yeah, people still do it. They like to evoke something and then have that secure feeling of knowing that they're the ones who did that. That's um, true. But I think in the most case, uh, at least me personally, when people talk about um, indigenous peoples or like joke about like redskins or like joke about squaw or like just random words, right? Or like... Um, the fact that not a lot of people know the history but that yet they're willing to like joke about it or say it in a sure. different matter that's where i mean the only reason why jokes are funny is because of the reality of it and so if the reality isn't even true but you're willing to joke about it then like there, that shows no respect i can live with that <laughs> I, I i can definitely live with it. i mean i i think from for me you know i know so little about the culture admittedly so you know i i don't even know what the right nomenclature is and we're in an era right now that it's like you know what do you say you know what's the right thing to anyone listening what would be the proper nomenclature would you say native you wouldn't say native american you'd say indigenous peoples because like i said too it's hard you can't group us all together we have different languages we have different cultures we have different deities um it would just yeah and then native america of america vespucci discovered america no not really we were here before. before so that's where that term gets a lot right. of mixed feelings also yeah i mean, I mean you know i i think i i think we're going to i i guess i could say if one of the things we get right during this whole cancel culture social justice it could be this mm -hmm. this could be one of the things that we get right because at the end of the day i don't think at least in my circles, I can say. I mean, nobody's using the term red skin in a derogatory, you know, or at least inflammatory. Yeah, you and guys grew up with it, with the team being that. And it's a team, but the name behind it is, uh, and the, the time that it was named and why it was named, the history of it. I mean, I get that it's a team, and it, so, you like, who wants to hate a team? Right. <laughs> who, wants, who wants to hate the Redskins? Like, yeah. Yeah and it's like who is it is it the team's fault you know when does the, the everybody looks for the fault right exactly. and it's kind of that's a, that's where i think the drama comes in it's like yep. it's not a fault that like just fix it and get it right whatever it is yep. fix it and, and make it right and whatever it is and however it looks whenever it's done whatever the mascot i guess is at the end of the day right but i mean I think people's fear is like, where does it stop? You know, taking taking the indigenous people out of it. I think the fear is, where does it stop? Right, and and I think you can appreciate that. It's like, what's the next thing? We're, you know, some, and I'm not picking on this. Like something, some Karen's gonna come out of the woodwork and complain about. You know what I mean? It's like it's like the Office. The Office isn't on Netflix anymore because it's too, you know you talk to um, Steve Carell's like I would never ever be Michael again in this time in this day and age because it's too offensive and I'm not trying to hurt anyone's feelings but at the same time he, you know and a small part of me thinks it's okay it's it, you know a small part of me thinks look history is not going to be kind to a lot of things and and times were different and and I think you know, people are going to always be offensive. I, I, I say this all the time. I think people are going to be in a room with a thousand people and you're not going to rub everybody the right way. Everything yeah. that everybody does isn't going to rub everyone the right way. And that's part of life. Yeah. You know, I think we all shoot for a B, right? Or an A, you know, get 90 or 80%, you know, and, and you're happy. I'm one of the most offensive people that walks the planet, but I try to be respectful. There's a difference. Exactly. So, you know, being offensive or saying what's on your mind 
is an okay thing as long as people understand, you know, hey, we're going to move on from this, you know, and, and whatever, and say your piece, you know, if you don't, I always say it's better to I say this to friends a lot. It's better to say, like, if you don't like someone, just say, hey, I don't like you, you know, like, we don't get along. I don't like you. Instead, I think where, where the, the Band-Aid theory, and it becomes a little harder, is when you get into the insults and you get into the, the minutiae of it. I just, you know, I've learned... You know, you're not going to rub everybody the right way. Lord knows your boss doesn't rub everybody the right way. I mean, that stuff happens. That's part of the game. Uh, you know, and I think it's there's a difference between saying, you know, I don't get along with you versus, you know, or we can't be friends versus, you know, insulting someone and, and going that route. And I think there's a big difference. And I think some of the things that have been left to linger uh, are, you know, if, if a culture says, hey, this is insulting to us, like this is not okay, that's different. Yeah, completely different. When you, know? you start to, like I said, a joke's only punny because of the reality of it. And if you don't even know the reality of what you're saying, oh, you're that's just yeah, taking taking a whole tribe and a whole people into your idea of your your assumptions and then throwing out your opinions without even being educated is where it starts to get like okay, okay, now you're gonna like there, yeah, you could be funny and offensive and ride that line, but then you're gonna cross it as soon as you're throwing in a whole people and think you know what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, growing up, I was, I came, you know, from Italian descent. So believe me, I've heard every insult there is to hear Italians, uh, not on the level of, of indigenous folks, but, but definitely we, we took our share uh, of insults and, and, you know, you learn to take it in stride, but I think everybody was on the level uh, in terms of understanding, you know, everybody came with their own baggage in Boston. You had the Irish, the Italians and you know, you had the wasps. So all was a, uh, was a, a interesting melting pot to say the least. Uh, but you know, I think, um, I learned a lot from that explanation and understanding a little bit about it because there's not enough in the history books, right? You can, you can ask Google, you can ask Siri about native Americans and it'll talk about us in the past tense. Yeah. Like everything is just so brushed under the rug still. And that's why I think a lot of us are offended easily because we're still living in a poverty ish i guess state i would like to say sustainable state i would uh, really like if we had our land if we we're able to own our own places you know so because then where, where's that motivation to to uh, to have something where's that motivation to say that you've earned something when you can't you still can't do you get offended a little bit when the the, you know the the black community is talking about reparations and everything else and there's you guys like what the fuck about us no um because they you know everyone has their own troubles everyone has their own history um i think educating people about it or at least bringing awareness to these situations is a lot of help and so whenever i'm on like um what is the cl uh they're a clubhouse i do yeah, a lot of club clubhouse I, people talk about clubhouse i gotta yeah. look into that and i was on this uh afro and native kind of uh forum and it was it was like very in insightful because there's plenty of other oh, there's plenty of other problems out there that are still stemming from just 200 years ago and mm. it's involving a whole like it's involving a whole people and the trickle of it down with the lineage is just impossible. Like it's impossible to gather everyone and come up with a cohesive narrative. Yeah, yeah, it really is. So just being able to accept and understand and intentionally not offend. Is there a documentary or something you would suggest people watch or is there like to get a good insight into like the culture and everything in between? Um, there's actually a couple of shows on like Amazon Prime. I don't really know them off the top of my head, but, um, uh, yes and no. I have a documentary too, actually. <laughs> it's supposed to be out sometime soon. Um, this, the, the dude who was shooting it lives here in Vegas and we've been trying to get on. Oh, that's wild. Yeah. Page about it. Um, but just like, you know, the internet's right there. Just. You just gotta sift <laughs> through the bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh. I mean, gonna get away from Google. Oh my goodness, it's propaganda. <laughs> it's propaganda. Of course it is. <laughs> like big time. I've, I'm trying to only listen to NPR these days, but that's still its own bias. Yeah. <laughs> now I don't know the answer to this. I, I'd be curious to know your thoughts. Like, do, do indigenous families do they typically vote Democrat or Republican? Honestly, I have no idea. 
I have no idea because the Democratic Party is the one who put us on reses. Um, the government, but like nobody really wants. Or, I don't know. I don't know. But I they think. vote in elections. Mm -hmm. um, they vote in elections. I think in Arizona went Democrat this year for the first time. Um, but I mean, there's plenty of different reses. I don't know what like the Dakotas did or what. Um, yeah, that's a funny thing about Democrats. They free, they 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 put they put everyone in slavery and put everybody on reservations. Yet now all of a sudden they're uh, champions of the cause, so to speak. It's I find that quite quite comical. It's, it's too yeah. political. I know, I know. It's it's a touchy thing because, it, like I said, especially with reses, like we can't really. And then, but the the Republican Party was sticking the pipelines through just like just last year, just right before this. So it's like, where do we? We don't have a voice, you know what I mean? Like, uh, what we would like to agree on and compromise Look, with. I, you could get close because you could get, like, The Rock or Tulsi Gabbard to run, and that's close. That's I, He said he's going to, too. Yeah, that's close. I mean, that's in the backyard. It's it's Samoan, but it's it's you're knocking on the door there. Yeah. <laughs> you're getting warm, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Has there been any other political candidates that have been close? I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't, your guess would be as good as mine. No, no. I, I mean, not that. No, I mean, it's pretty wild. Yeah, I mean, you're knocking on the door with those two. I know that's pretty exciting. I imagine Tulsi would be. In, I mean, she already runs, so that's an interesting, an interesting candidate if you can get her to come out of the private sector because now she's a private citizen. But she'd be interesting. She'd be a very interesting candidate. With I said, her and The Rock. Yeah, would be an interesting combo. But that would be you know for for the other side but they hate them on the other side because they're I know. yeah it's, it's weird. so touchy it's so touchy it's super touchy but it's interesting um you know to hear this and have you explain it to me i feel like i need a lesson like a, a, a history lesson i need to go home and watch a couple documentaries and understand this a little bit better and i and to be in fairness to me in the northeast the indigenous culture in 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 that whole culture isn't something that is in your face you know i really didn't know anything about it until foxwoods put a casino in you know what i mean in connecticut mm -hmm. i think it was what uncasville so you know until then i didn't know much about it and not a lot of it was taught to me yeah and that was uh you know i want to say like it was around the time i was in high school that that happened mm -hmm. and that was when i was like oh wait a minute there's indigenous people in the united states mm -hmm. so i feel like yeah it's been i guess the term that's probably used on the res is like whitewashed mm, or colonizer <laughs> yeah. or, or, you know um like stripped from the history books Western, yeah 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 um yeah. but it yeah it's it's a hard concept because like i said a lot of people are like oh I, i've done like a bunch of field work when i was going to college right. and a bunch of my instructors and a bunch of the kids i was going doing field work with would we'd like find axe heads or we'd find like pottery shards and then i'm like oh yeah no that's pueblo because because i know because i have friends who are pueblos and i go to their feast days and i see them making their pots and i'm like yeah that's Pueblo." and they're like how long ago do you think this was i'm like honest like not that long ago right. and we still do it now and then they'd refer to it like native americans used to the navajos used to and then it would just i'd be so offended and they'd have to just keep reminding me that that's how they grew up you know that society they're everyone's taught that mm. we're kind of a thing of the past and that we have all this money and that we are the casino money yeah the fictitious casino money yeah right? so we're just running around here entitled mm. and but when the reality is in 20 years before covid was in place navajo or Diné, navajo is also a derogatory term because it means like in spanish when the spaniards named us navajo it was like uh the head slitters or with a knife mm -hmm. navajos um, but we refer to ourselves as Diné, and that's just the people. Um, so Diné, um, I forgot where I was going with this. <laughs> the lang well, the, the nomenclature. Oh, um, so before COVID in 20 years, it was said that our language is going to be deceased because we're an oral culture. And like you, like you had mentioned too, a lot of people are kind of just hesitant to be sharing and educating because we don't want social appropriation. We don't want to be raped of our culture and who we are and what we right. stand for because it's been happened it's happened before you know and i think 
right now everybody's kind of on the same page with this pandemic and having to be in quarantine and they understand their rights being taken away and they're just in that same spot but we've been i mean not not saying that we're like um trying to like compete with anybody on this because everyone nobody should feel like that nobody should feel oppressed Mm. but i think we're finally on like an equal playing ground and where i can share my education with my tribe my people and our hardships and being able to overcome and just keep going and keep like not giving up because we're still becoming champions you know right so listen it's an amazing story it really is i i i'm blown away I, like i said i'm gonna have to do some research and uh, you know having the opportunity to kind of pick your brain and and just have you in here is is huge enough do you find yourself educating people when you're just walking around the pi and hanging out do you find yourself doing that all the time i imagine right yeah yeah and so i want to be more um i just want to be this like walking book like this walking encyclopedia for my people and be like a great ambassador you know there's there have been plenty of ambassadors and Mm. um and i think especially with a uh native new mexico new mexican in in the senate right now i mean i'm just saying just bringing awareness you know right making sure that people still know that it it was i remember going to um and get together in college and people were like oh you're now so you speak english and i'm like i'm speaking to you <laughs> <laughs> they're like you still live in wagons and i'm like are you out of your mind <laughs> yeah, yeah i'm like where do you get off but then i also have to remind myself like okay okay this is what they're taught you know and they think it's appropriate just because i'm native to ask ridiculous questions you still questions. live in a wagon i literally asked that i was asked that and i was like hmm. okay <laughs> this is where we are <laughs> yeah. this is where we are so like in a sense i've kind of had to d- do the sharing of education for a while for a long while w- when you're walking around the pi do you ever want to fight cowboy <laughs> I have a funny cowboy story. So he has all these animals on his ranch, right? Right. He's like, I have this white buffalo. Can you get a medicine man over to to, oh, wow. to pray for you? And I'm like, cowboy, you're a white guy who is keeping a white buffalo captive. I don't think a medicine man is going to be like down for that, dude. Oh, <laughs> Those man. things are sacred. Like you're supposed to let them run off and be, you know, you don't put them behind. But so that was a funny story and i'm just like no no cowboy he's cool though i mean like he's totally comfortable with if you could ever get a medicine man in here i'd be interested that's where it starts to get really tricky too because then they're open up for any sort of anybody's jokes in a sense no i i'd be very i'm really interested in in the science behind it and just a lot of the the rituals and the i i I think that stuff's freaking amazing to hear about like I said, you know, part of the Navajo tradition is wake up every morning, greet the sun, wake up with the sun, make sure you're not wasting the day and you set an intention and then you're appreciative. And so through all of my elements, I just finally came to grasp and mm. that that's going to be part of my morning routines and that's going to be my therapy. And that was the culture before I was, you know, that was it before I was even born. It's, sust- it's sustainable. It works. <laughs> yeah, I I think it works today. It works for anybody. I think it's common sense stuff. And, uh, you know, it's been honestly a pleasure having you in. I know I can't keep you. You got to get to the PI. Uh, but I just want to say we were talking with Dana here regarding Dr. Heather. Mm-hmm. And we referred to her as a medicine woman. She's 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 along those lines. Is that is you know, is that something that's offensive if we called her a medicine woman, or is she pretty damn close? I mean, she knows her stuff. She's, she's magical, and she. I really appreciate that she um, understands to allow your body to recoup without shoving down all types of pharmaceuticals. Right. So she's like, yeah, your body's, you know, like, especially with my concussion, because I'm mm-hmm. supposed to given, be given, like, these medications, too. And I don't, I, you know, I, I'm spiritually inclined. I'm comfortable with being vulnerable and having patience to heal and learn. And so through her guidance, it's been a pretty comfortable one. Well. I'm going to stick with that title for her. I think that she deserves it. I think that she's earned it. I don't know how we get it for her, but I think, I think that's something special. Uh, I appreciate having you. Listen, 
I've gone for an hour and 10. I don't want to keep you. I know you got to get to the PI, but this is, this has been huge. I love it. Once you get back in the round, I'd love to have you back, especially after the hunt. Yeah. I think that would be really cool. Yeah. You know, I hope this, I know it was tough getting us together and it took a minute. Uh, I appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I really you. do. I appreciate it. And uh, I want to hear more about this and I want to hear more about the hunt. So I want to take a minute. I want to thank all the sponsors and I want to thank Nico for coming in. I think, um, I think she left me a lot to think about. Shit. I got to go back to, I got to burn all my history books. Seriously. Yeah like Google on fire, but I, I appreciate it. And I appreciate her time. And I want to thank all the sponsors, uh, head over to the website and all the links are down below. Uh, I appreciate everyone and appreciate everybody's time and we're going to sign out.